The first thing to learn in anatomy is how to talk like an anatomist. In this video we'll be looking at anatomical terminology, the language used by scientists and healthcare professionals to describe the body. Now you may be wondering why do we need a separate language? Why can't we just use the same terms we use for everything else? Well anatomical terminology has three important advantages over everyday language. First it's consistent. In science and medicine it's really important that everyone calls the same thing by the same name. Without this consistency there's the chance for ambiguity and for mistakes to be made. Everyday language is anything but consistent, with new words being added all the time and existing words changing their meaning. Even if two people speak the same language there can be differences between them. For example, what do we call this animal in English? If you're from the UK you may call this a ladybird, but if you're from across the pond this may be a ladybug, and if you're from deepest darkest Norfolk you may call this a Bishy Barnaby. Whilst all of these names are correct, using them in a scientific context could cause confusion. Although to be fair I think using Bishy Barnaby anywhere outside of the NR postcode is going to cause confusion. That's why all entomologists refer to this critter as the Cochinella seven punctata, the seven spotted ladybird. In anatomy we have exactly the same problem, of different people calling the same thing by different names. So if you have a patient with an issue in this region, they could describe it as pain in the gut, discomfort in their belly, or maybe an unpleasant rumble in their tum tum. However, to avoid confusion, every medical professional will refer to this area as the abdomen. 2. Anatomical terminology is a descriptive language. Now, have you ever struggled to find the right word for something? One of the things that can be hardest to do is to describe something visual using words alone. Now, this is something you'll encounter a lot in medicine, where you're having to create written notes about the appearance or location of a condition. So for example here we have a patient with a large rash over their torso, do you think you'd be comfortable using everyday language to describe the position and extent of this rash? If you nodded and went yeah I think so, then I'd like you to put that to the test. Grab someone in your house, a relative, a pet, a friend, whoever it may be, and try describing the location of that rash without using illustrations or gestures. Ready? Go. So how did you get on? Did they understand what you were trying to say? Could you easily find the words that you wanted? And how long did it take you to give your description? If you answered no, no or ages to any of those questions, then anatomical terminology is here to help. Anatomical terminology will allow you to easily convey complex anatomical information in words alone. Number three, anatomical terminology is precise. Precision is a huge part of medicine. Just last year alone there were over 200 never events where surgery was performed in the wrong area of the body or on the wrong side. Using and understanding precise terminology could help you avoid making such a mistake. However everyday language is nowhere near precise enough. Imagine a patient come to you complaining of pain above their wrist. Where could that be? Do you think it's here? Could it be here? What about here? Or maybe even here? Have a think and see which one you think it might be. So which one should be correct? Well the answer is any of them. A phrase like above the rift is far too ambiguous to accurately describe a location. Anatomical terminology resolves this problem by giving you the terms and phrases to unambiguously describe locations in the body. So I've hopefully now demonstrated the importance of anatomical terminology, we're now ready to learn some. The first thing to meet is the anatomical position. Whenever we use these terms we imagine the body is in this position, with the arms down by their side and the palms facing forwards. From here we can divide the body into left and right halves using an imaginary line known as the midline. Now in this illustration you may have noticed that left and right are the wrong way round. That's because in anatomy and medicine, when we talk about left and right, we don't mean our left and right as the viewer, we mean the patient's left and right. Now the midline is an imaginary line slicing through the middle of the body, and it's what we call one of the planes of the body, and there are a few others that you need to know. The midline is also known as the sagittal plane, and splits the body into two roughly equal halves. If we take a slice in the same direction on either side of the midline, we have to call this a parasagittal plane. We also have the horizontal plane that divides the body horizontally, and splitting it into an upper and lower portion and we call this the horizontal plane at whatever level we take it. 
Finally, we have the coronal plane passing from right to left, dividing the body into front and back portions. Another way to divide the body is to break it down into regions. Now, I won't run through all of these, I've provided them with an illustration below, but there are some important distinctions to note between anatomical and everyday language. So, most people refer to the area between their hip and foot as the leg. In anatomy, we call this the lower limb, and the leg of a specific area between the knee and the ankle. Similarly, most people call the area from their shoulder to their hand their arm. But in anatomy, this is the upper limb, and the arm is only found between the shoulder and the elbow. Next, we have some terms that allow us to be even more specific in where we describe locations. These terms relate to positions in the body, and are the anatomical equivalent of up, down, outside, inside, front and back. First, we have superior and inferior. Superior means towards the head, inferior means towards the feet. Next, we have medial and lateral, and these relate to the midline. The closer a structure is to the midline, the more medial it is. The further away it moves, the more lateral it becomes. Finally, we have anterior and posterior. If something is anterior, it goes towards the front of the body, and if something is posterior, it heads towards the back. We also have some special terms that are only used in the limbs. These are proximal and distal. Proximal and distal relate to the limb's attachment to the body, so in the upper limb the shoulder, and in the lower limb the hip. If something is closer to that attachment and has more proximity, we describe it as proximal. If something is further away from that attachment and a greater distance from it, we describe it as distal. Now you may be wondering why do we use these terms when they seem to do the same thing as superior and inferior? Well, in the anatomical position, that's true. But when we move our limbs, those terms can become confusing. So for example, if you have your arm down by your side, the shoulder should be superior to the hand. But if you throw your arm up in the air like you just don't care, then the hand now becomes superior to the shoulder. If we use the terms proximal and distal, those relationships never change. So when my hand is down by my side, it's distal to the shoulder. If I move my hand up above my head, it's still the furthest point in that limb from the shoulder. Now these terms can be used in two main ways. We can describe position of one structure relative to another, so I could say that my head is superior to my chest, or that my abdomen is inferior to my chest. We can also use these terms to describe the faces or aspects of our structures. So if I pat the top of my head, this is the superior aspect. If I feel my shin bone, that's on the anterior aspect of my leg. And if you've ever banged your funny bone, you've hit the medial aspect of your elbow. Finally, we have two terms that help us describe depths within the body. If something is superficial, it's close to the surface, and if something is deep, it's hidden inside the body, underneath other tissues. So, for example, the skin is the most superficial layer of the thigh, and the bone for the deepest layer. In between are the muscles, which are deep to the skin, but superficial to the bones. So that is it, your introduction to anatomical terminology, and I would recommend keep using these terms, keep practicing them, and so you get used to them. So if you're having a Sunday roast, maybe ask for some chicken from the lateral aspect of the chest. Or if someone steals your milk, you can ask where the superior portion has gone. If you want to test yourself, there should be a quiz down below. If you have any questions, please feel free to get in touch. But other than that, thank you for watching, take care, and I'll hopefully see you soon. Cheers.